Good morning and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, before we begin, uh, we are pushing a quick poll question. Uh, where are you in your Node SQL adoption? Uh, options I currently use SilaDB, I currently use Apache Cassandra. I currently use uh, another NoSQL database. Uh, I'm currently evaluating NoSQL. I'm interested in learning more about SilaDB or none of the above. Uh, and uh, while you're voting, I will uh, think I will introduce myself. So my name is Pavel. Uh, I'm from SilaDB. SilaDB is, uh, is a database. Uh, prior to becoming a database guy, I've been a kernel guy for some years, playing with containers and with what you nowadays know as Docker. In SilaDB, I recently played with DiskIO uh, and the way Scylla keeps its data on storage. Uh, and one of the outcomes of this work is the idea of phantom gems I'm presenting today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with SilaDB yet, uh, it's a database built for game changers. Uh, it's created by the founders of the KVM hypervisor. SilaDB uh, was conceived with key design characteristics to power this next tech cycle and resolve many of the challenges posed uh, when operating distributed systems at scale. In particular, SilaDB is a high throughput and low latency distributed NoSQL database, uh, increasing database throughput, improving P99 latency and reducing total cost. Are principal drivers behind teams like yours for selecting SilaDB. In 2020, SilaDB received uh, InfoWorld's prestigious Technology of the Year award, and it was truly an honor to be among fellow recipients like Tableau, Databricks, and Snowflake. A couple of weeks ago, we launched SilaDB 5 with several new innovative features. Uh, in fact, yesterday we had a webinar covering what's new, which I highly encourage you to watch. Uh, and along with SilaDB 5 launch, the adoption of our database technology has grown to over 400 key players worldwide. Uh, many of you will recognize some of the companies among the select pictured here, such as Starbucks, who leverage SilaDB for inventory management, Zillow for real-time property listing and uh, uh, updates, and Comcast, Xfinity, who power all DVR scheduling with SkillDB. If you are interested in knowing how we can help you more, feel free to engage with us. Uh, to summarize, if you care about having low latencies while having high throughput for your application, we are certain that SilaDB is a good fit for you. Back to technical part. Uh, making Scylla become as awesome, awesome and performing is possible thanks to several design decisions. Uh, first, Scylla was written in C++ with uh, great attention to all the possible optimizations of hardware usage. Second, and it's probably even more important than the former, is the C star library that sits between Scylla and the OS kernel. Uh, and that's in turn resides on two pillars. Uh, share nothing approach, in which CPU cores do not implicitly, sorry, explicitly synchronize with each other, uh, and future promise computation model with non-blocking IOs, in which portions of code don't ever block the running thread, thus wasting CPU or networking time in vain. And the last but not least, uh, sort of a disclaimer, uh, this word gems. It's no way any technical or well settled or common term for the effect we'll soon meet. Uh, I just called it after traffic phantom gems that had been studied and described quite a while ago. Uh, and the word phantom I also took from that work to emphasize that, like on roads, gems in data flow appear from nowhere and it's not immediately obvious why it happened at all. 
Okay, so when you look at the system that works at some speed, like data throughput is shown to be some megabytes per second value or operations per second are observed to fluctuate around some point, often the question, why is this number not larger, appears. Uh, and when examining the system, several conclusions can be drawn. Uh, it can be hardware, uh, the system can limit itself, or it can be non-obvious reason, one of which is the phantom jam. Uh, so the hardware, it's usually the only and unfortunately unbreakable verdict. Like you are seeing a network flow of one gigabyte per second, uh, but your network adapter is documented to be such, so there is no way to squeeze more from it said, but true. Uh, and of course, it's not only the network adapter to blame, it can as well be the disk or the CPU. Uh, sometimes the cold print sounds like it's RAM. The system has too low RAM, but uh, digging it further typically shows that when the system runs out of memory, it always starts compensating this shortage uh, by loading the disk and CPU. So it again ends up being CPU or IO still the hardware. If not the hardware, then the problem can be found in the software itself. And it's not that rare that the system is explicitly programmed or configured to self-limit uh, before it hits the natural hardware limit. In Linux, there is a mature and flexible set of C-group controllers that can be used to cap the usage of pretty much any hardware resource out there, CPUs, disks, network, uh, this artificial throttling can be used for many reasons. Uh, one of them, for example, is a theorem that limiting a resource is one of the ways to provide guarantee of that resource for other potential consumers. Uh, another reason for artificial throttling can be an attempt to chase good latencies uh, on some hardware. Some time ago, our CTO, Ivy Kiviti, and me had a webinar uh, here is the link on the slide. Uh, we had it here on Linux Foundation, uh, describing how rate limiting disk I.O. can be used to achieve best I.O. latencies. Uh, the same work, by the way, is also available in writing on our company's blog. Uh, so you're welcome to come and read it too. And finally, uh, if it's not a hardware, not explicit throttling, uh, there can be non-obvious reason for a slowdown. And let's proceed and see one of them. Uh, why one of? Likely because there can be more that hadn't been discovered. So let's take a look at the pretty common and generic producer-consumer model, programming model. Uh, here is a subsystem that generates some data at a rate of p messages per second, and another subsystem that consumes this data at a rate of at most c messages per second. Uh, in order to operate, the consumption rate shouldn't be less than the generation rate. So from now on, I'll always assume that that's the case. Uh, next, what a producer can be. It's pretty much anything. Uh, for example, a thread or process that does IO or sends packets over the network. Uh, and the same for the consumer. It's pretty much anything that consumes what the producer generates. Uh, for simplicity, from now on, let's imagine that the producer is a Linux process sending requests to the disk and the consumer is the disk itself. Uh, but as I told, the conclusions would apply to any kind of producers and consumers. Uh, to make this model more real, and actually see the uh, phantom gem, uh, we need to add an interposer to this chain, uh, which I called a dispatcher. Uh, it acts as a consumer and producer at the same time. Uh, it gets the data from the producer. Uh, it can queue it internally, and then it forwards the data to the real consumer. Uh, it does so at the maximum rate of d wake-ups per second and d small messages per wake-up. Uh, <clears throat> this dispatcher component I introduced here is in fact not artificial as it might seem to be. Uh, dispatchers are in fact everywhere. Uh, there is an IO scheduler in the Linux kernel that works exactly as described. 
uh, interposing the IO flow from process to disk. There is the same thing in the networking stack called Traffic Shaper. Uh, and if you think of it, the whole TCP outgoing path is the dispatcher, because uh, when you send uh, the data into a socket from your program, it doesn't immediately hit, hit the wire. Uh, TCP code in the kernel may, and it actually does, collect the packets internally. It merges them or splits them and then sends them out the way it prefers. Generally speaking, adding a dispatcher into the producer-consumer model is always justified to provide something. For example, fire scheduling, resource control, access policy enforcement, buffering, routing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, the dispatcher can become a bottleneck itself if it works too slow uh, by like limiting itself, waking up too rarely or sending too few messages uh, down the pipeline. Uh, to get a real phantom gem from now on, I will also assume that the dispatcher uh, doesn't slow down itself and passes at least as many messages per its wake up down the pipeline as it would have passed if it was fully synchronous, just forwarding everything one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, to conduct the experiment, I started with loading Scylla with stress workload, uh, but the effect was uh, like blurred and hard to demonstrate. So I started dropping unrelated pieces of, uh, of this experimental stand from it. Uh, eventually, I left with just a C star application doing simple network to disk forwarding. And later, and eventually, I patched it more uh, to exclude the real hardware completely. Uh, and I just left with, uh, with a simulator with three bare software components the producer generating messages at the configured rate, the dispatcher waking up every half a millisecond. I say half a millisecond just to have some uh, scale, uh, but it, it can be any timing. Uh, and the dispatcher not to lock uh, intentionally, it was forwarding 50% uh, more of the messages as, as, it, as it had to, to the consumer maximum rate. Uh, and the consumer consuming the messages at a fixed rate of uh, 200,000 messages per second. Uh, with that perfect and clean model, no gems were observed. It just worked. Uh, so I made another change to the simulator. Uh, the change was the add of artificial jitter to each of the components uh, to simulate some real life behavior. Uh, in ideal circumstances, when messages are generated, dispatched, and consumed at precisely given rate, no gems were seen, as I told. Uh, jitter was injected, uh, jitter injected randomly distributed disturbance to the generation, to dispatching, and to consumption uh, delays. Uh, to be more specific, I tried to simulate uh, real life-ish non-uniformity uh, and used Poisson distributed delays with the average delay being the configured one. And with Jitter, uh, that's what I got. Uh, first, uh, I added Jitter to the producer. So producer started generating messages, not one every uh, fixed fraction of a second, but with, with more randomized delays. The x-axis on the plot represents the message generation speed. Uh, and the y-axis is the message passed through time throughout the whole pipeline. Uh, more exactly, there are three lines for the maximum P95 and P99. Uh, also, pay attention that y-axis scale is logarithmic. Uh, so first of all, messages take different time to proceed. Uh, that's OK. It's not yet gems, just, uh, just notice this. Uh, since messages are generated with random de delays, uh, it might take some small random delays uh, in the dispatcher. Uh, and the second thing is that when the messages are generated at the speed close to their possible consumption speed, the right part of the plot, the time to process the message increases about 200 times. Uh, it looks like some bad news, but still it's not. It's not yet the phantom gem I'm talking about. Uh, 
this 200 times increase uh, can, can be explained too, but that's not the most interesting part. Uh, now, if adding jitter to the uh, consumer, uh, similar thing happens. Uh, messages get processed at different times. Uh, when the generation rate is close to the consumption rate, the time to process goes approximately 200 times larger. Uh, that's, that's really sad, but again, it, it, it's not the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing happens uh, when the jitter is added to the dispatcher. Uh, first of all, note that a plot looks completely different. Uh, second, note that the scale of the y-axis is 100 times larger. It now goes up to seconds. Uh, and the second and the third thing uh, is that some problem happens much earlier than before reaching the maximum generation uh, speed. Uh, to get better uh, idea of what's going on, let's put all three plots all together and keep only P99 uh, line. Uh, red and green uh, lines are about producer and consumer, uh, and the blue one is about a dispatcher. Uh, so what, 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 what's new here? Uh, first, even when the generation rate is uh, small, uh, relatively small, jitter in the dispatcher makes processing time uh, 20 times worse, uh, which is already some bad news. Uh, prior to this, uh, if the generation rate was 10%, 20% of the maximum consumption rate, uh, the time to process was small. Uh, now it's 20 times worse. Uh, second, and that's exactly where the phantom gem is, uh, is that starting from here in this experiment from the 160,000 messages per second, uh, the plot goes uh, really up, but it doesn't just goes up. Uh, if looking in the experiment in more details, uh, it would become clear that at that point, dispatcher effectively stopped maintaining the incoming flow, and its internal queue just grew infinitely up until the end of the experiment. Uh, and that's exactly the phantom gems. Uh, remember, the the producer didn't produce more messages than the consumer could consume. Neither dispatcher was uh, programmed or configured to limit itself or the pipeline. It was over queuing the messages uh, into consumer. Uh, the effect that we've seen in the previous slide uh, makes the idea of what we later called effective dispatch rate. Uh, this is the maximum speed, uh, maximum generation rate at which dispatcher may still pass the message through itself. Uh, in the previous slide, it was about 20% of the maximum, and it was only dispatcher that uh, was affected to that. Uh, in fact, uh, dispatcher may overload the consumer even more uh, than it did in that experiment, uh, but it will still get jammed. Uh, this is how I checked it. Uh, the, in this plot, the x-axis is the overload coefficient. Uh, the dispatcher, according to this, would send one and a half to four and a half times more messages per it wake up than it should, according to plain uh, consumer expectations. The y-axis is the effective maximum throughput uh, in the sense that I've described above. Uh, that's the point at which dispatcher uh, stops maintaining the queue and just grows it infinitely without any chances to, to handle it uh, if the rate persists. Uh, there are three lines. They are for three different wake-up ticks, but they do not change anything. Uh, the only thing that matters is this uh, x axis overload factor. Uh, you can see that uh, it indeed helps, uh, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. Uh, overloading the consumer too much, uh, it increases the effective dispatch rate, but it has a negative side effect in the sense that it leaves the dispatcher with much less control over the flow. Uh, in the extreme case, when dispatcher just doesn't queue anything, uh, it will have the effective rate of 100%. Like it will just forward everything and will, nothing will get stuck. Uh, but then the whole point of the dispatcher gets lost. Uh, it will lose the ability to dispatch anything. Uh, 
some extra bad news is that I don't have a full correct theory of the effect. Um, probably I don't yet have it. Uh, but eventually the understanding of this thing uh, was reduced down to three items that are uh, needed to come together to, to get a phantom gem. Uh, first is the interposer component called dispatcher. Uh, second is the internal dispatcher queue that it uses for any kind of activity it's created for, uh, which means that dispatchers without queues, they will not produce this. Uh, and the most important thing out there is the so-called cooperative preemption. The last part actually is the main reason why it's very hard to observe this on plain Linux, fortunately. The cooperative preemption is what makes the dispatcher starve for the CPU time when it needs to dispatch its queue down the pipeline. In simple words, in cooperative preempting system, any code that's executing on a CPU cannot be forcibly preempted. Instead, it decides to yield uh, the CPU to, to some other component on its own. In Linux, the preemption is voluntary uh, and has had been such for long. A uh, long time already. Uh, if there is a dispatcher that needs CPU at some point in time, chances that it will get it are extremely high. Linux will most likely wake it up and give it a CPU. Uh, and it would take significant efforts to put the system into a state when components get unreasonable delays. And uh, even if doing so, there will pop up more like real gems, not just phantom gems. Uh, so having said that, the phantom gems friendly uh, environments are those with uh, non-enforced CPU yielding. Uh, for example, proteins, uh, one of maybe better known example of coroutines is uh, Go routines in Golang. Uh, some implementations of unikernels that do not implement uh, voluntary preemption. And unfortunately, the CSR component uh, which I mentioned in the beginning of the, of the webinar, uh, on top of which Scylla is built. And a uh, few words uh, as a wrap up. Uh, first, the reasons for a system to work slower than you expect it to uh, might not necessarily sit in the hardware. Uh, weird, non obvious effects may happen during component center action. Uh, and the way to pin them down, and that's the way how we came across this in Scylla, is definitely a well-designed uh, and maintained monitoring system and good understanding of what metrics in it mean uh, and the ability to read them and make good conclusions. Uh, this webinar also has its written version available on Scylla's company blog. Uh, it has a little bit more information than what I've just managed to describe here. Uh, so you're welcome to come and read it. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, and now we have uh, another quick audience poll for sense of scale. We'd like to understand how much data uh, do you have under management in your own transactional database system? Uh, below one terabyte, uh, one to 50 terabytes, 50 to 100 terabytes, or above 100 terabytes. Uh, please pick the answer that best matches your current data set. Uh, thank you for watching. Now I'm passing the word back to the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Paval, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you'll join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day. Uh, OK, now we, I guess we have uh, some time for questions. Do yeah, if you want to go ahead. Um, I don't see anything in the Q&A. So everyone, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. And um, we definitely have enough time to answer as many questions as you all may have. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there is, there is a question. 
Uh, does this effect happen only to disks or can it be uh, seen on, a, on any other hardware? Uh, that's a very good question. The answer is uh, yes, it can be seen in any other hardware. You can observe it in, in network adapters. Uh, and in fact, you can observe it not only in hardware, uh, consumer part can be anything. Uh, it can be any other piece of software. It can even be a high level other piece of software, for example, remote service. Uh, you still have chances to get it. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, does it help if the components uh, are executed on SMP machines on different CPU cores? Uh, frankly speaking, I didn't uh, conduct such an experiment uh, because C star, it pins everything to individual cores. Uh, and uh, my goal was to chase the gem happening on a single core. Uh, but from our understanding of it uh, on SMP, uh, you still can get it, though it will be, it can be harder to trigger, like it's hard to trigger it in, uh, in Linux with its volunteer preemption thing. Can you right. give everyone no, no. another, uh, yeah, any more questions? We give everyone like another minute or so. And um, Pavel, maybe if like people have questions afterwards, is there a good place for them to follow up with you? Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not very active on social media. Uh, if you want to contact me, I think I have it on slides. Let me check it, please. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, can, can I put my email into the chat? Will it be available? Yeah, yeah. If you want to put your email, just make sure it's uh, to everyone and then um, everyone on all the attendees will see it. Oh, okay. and it looks like we I... did get one more question in um, if you want to look in the Q&A. Oh, yes, we have a question. Did you estimate a delay based on data? Uh, you should check our TWAMP and BART protocols because they used to estimate measuring available bandwidth in the network. Uh, if I understood the question correctly, uh, I didn't uh, measure the delay. Uh, I actually generated the delay. Uh, the goal was to uh, find out or sort of proof uh, that uh, components can limit themselves in speed or throttle themselves uh, just because the way they are, they are programmed. Uh, so this thing, it didn't depend on the data size or specific latencies of the hardware. Uh, it just happened that the way these three components interacted with each other, uh, it was uh, this uh, sort of self-throttling uh, that we didn't like intentionally wanted to have it.
All right, if we don't have any other questions at this time, we can go ahead and wrap up. So thank you again so much to all for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. The recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.